Uh, hello, and welcome to KCP Community Meeting, December 7th, 2021. Um, I wanted to start off the meeting. I feel like every once in a while, I, I want to do a check and make sure that the format of this meeting and the agenda works. I basically always forget to create the meeting issue until the morning of or the day before this meeting. Uh, I could probably automate it if we feel like, but uh, do people like this format? Do people uh, prefer a doc? that like sort of is just a running doc that we share with the group that we I think it's great. I like it. You like the issue? The, the issue okay. plus the uh, video posted and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Andy, what's up? Um, it, it works. I have more familiarity with a running doc, but um, either is fine with me. I do think notes don't come out as cleanly as a running doc does, but I don't mm. see any reason it couldn't. There is like a slight benefit in the people being in the doc and being able to add like a couple of notes there. I'm not sure it leads to a better overall outcome. Um, I have definitely kind of like, as we've gone through this, Jason, I've been like, is this, this is interesting. Like there's yeah. parts about it. Like I like the comment section of leading into a meeting and um, it does make looking at some of the older meetings a little bit there, but it also, just reduces the things someone has to join to add a comment, which is mm -hmm. actually like the Google Doc, you have to be in KCP dev, and we would yeah, always yeah. have to have that. So it's kind of like a, this is a little bit more open ended for nodes, and it doesn't really block us from adding nodes as we go. Um, it's just a little bit less. Structured. Yeah, it does mean it, it kind of, uh, it means it kind of sucks if you want to add a note to something somebody else said, you can only append to the end of the list, you can't like, add a bullet point or whatever. Yeah. Okay, I'm not I'm not hearing any like massive upswell of hatred for this uh, plan. Uh, if that changes or if we find something else that's better, uh, I also like not having to require joining an issue or sorry, joining a, a, a mailing list just to comment on a thing. I feel like especially if we we're inviting external folks like like we did last week, like don't you know don't make them join a list just to say hi. But um, yeah, I don't think there's any perfect thing and they all kind of suck in different ways, but uh, I wanted to check. Um, I used to go back through the recording and try to take better notes. I'm terrible at contemporaneous note taking because uh, I get sidetracked and lost in trains of thought, but um, I used to go back and add notes and it was very labor intensive and I think value free for anyone else. Uh, so I can go back and do that if people thought that was useful or anyone else is welcome to if they feel like, but I think um, I think I will continue not to do that. Um, yeah, uh, as always, let me know if you have ideas or think this could be improved. Um, it's a work in progress. The other sort of housekeeping thing I wanted to mention at the top of this was that the CFP for the next KubeCon is coming up, I think next week, I think one week from now. Uh, I think we're doing a lot of cool stuff that we could talk about, that we could uh, brag about or ask for, beg for help on uh, if people are interested in doing that. I assume it's going to be a hybrid like the last ones have been. So I don't think even though it's in EU, I don't think it, I don't think you need to travel there to, to give a talk on it. Um, if anyone has any interest uh, and is just looking for someone to collaborate with or get ideas on, I'm, I'm willing to do that. Does anybody have any ideas or interest in giving a talk on anything? I think the sharded, uh, I, well, I think the concept of logical clusters is interesting and novel. I think the sharded API server is interesting and novel. Some of the multi-cluster stuff we're thinking of uh, uh, doing is, I think, novel and interesting. I'll probably propose one. I'm not sure exactly which of those it will be, but might be useful to do some lightning talks on areas of collaboration with other projects like the duck typing and mm -hmm. um, and stuff from last time. That's a good like something that gives a couple of projects an opportunity to collaborate and join forces. Um, those might be other fruitful areas. Yeah, yeah. Um, good call. Uh, all right. Well, yeah, I guess let, let me know if you have an idea that you'd like to develop into a whole talk. Uh, or I could give it with you, or I could give it, I could help you with it, whatever. Um, other than that, uh, we, uh, uh, Paul 
did the Herculean effort of filing 1 million GitHub issues for all of the items in our prototype 2 uh, milestone. That is uh, Stefan, hopefully, linked to the issue board. Yeah, just in addition to, to you mentioning the issues are now all in GitHub yeah. for prototype uh, 2. Kyle says this board. is 404. Is this only accessible to? You must be in the group, I think. Yeah, so you have to join. You have to get invited to. Can I make SCP. it public? I don't think this works because it's this beta version. Oh. Technically, it doesn't work. OK. I might click that later and see. Or I might uh, uh, try to make it public later and, and see if that works. Because uh, otherwise, uh, Kyle, I can add you to the org so you can see it at least. And, I'll, and, I'll and see if I see it now. There's a, a public toggle. Uh, it says everyone on the internet has read access, and you choose who has write and admin. See how it goes. OK. Uh, try it now, Kyle. Yep, it opened up for me. Nice. nice. Awesome. OK, uh, great. Um, so yeah, that's that's sort of where we will be. Um, this works, works for Jose, too. Um, let me present it. Is everyone seeing? Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is all the stuff we're sort of doing and thinking about uh, with little faces on each of them. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any updates on stuff they're doing that they want to share. Uh, I can go over the current latest progress on the namespace scheduler. Um, Stefan and I talked last, last week about uh, how to scope things down better. That was actually really useful because I was about to go build a webhook and nobody ever wants to build a webhook. So um, instead of having that, we're going to have namespaces created and are backed from outside the clusters, from outside the physical clusters. Uh, and then the syncer will have only, it will have complete access, but only to all of the namespaces it should and not be able to create anything else or do anything else. Yeah, that's a, that's a great simplification. And um, ultimately, like, that's another one of those, the more I think about it, that was a, we didn't put enough time in upfront saying, this is like a cube gap which is, in theory, access to a subset of things by prefix is O1 or O login at best. And so like it match, it is it has mechanical sympathy with all of the things we already do. Just nobody had a use case for it before. Um, namespaces are effectively a prefix scan problem. Um, and this was an area that I just completely forgot to like write up early on, which is like, thinking about the security system of subdividing a cluster so that a cluster is actually subdivided. No one has really done. It's a different type of subdivision than logical cluster. It's a like, like why is, why is a chunk of resources not efficiently allocatable out of namespace scope? So whether we solve it in cube or whether we solve it with a different mechanism, it's a great way to punt the problem. And also another one of those areas to go build um, there may actually be a lot of value to existing communities, like the hierarchical uh, namespaces work and SIG multi-tenancy um, in many places could have benefited from aspects of this. Um, if we're in the guts of Cube um, already, there's some places where like, this might actually be a really efficient thing to go do. Um, and it might not be. Um, it does require a bunch of touch points. We shouldn't spend all our innovation tokens in one place right now. Yeah, to 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 clarify and elaborate the proposal or the like idea of the thing we would ideally want is some way of expressing uh, I can create things in namespaces where the namespace has this prefix has has a prefix KCP dash and then anything in there I can do I can create I guess you could the permission would also be I can create namespaces but only those create uh, uh, with that prefix. Um, those should be relatively straightforward checks to do in the API server. It doesn't require any other index. It doesn't require any other lookup. It's just, you know, yeah, we are, matching. We are, we are lacking the label admission. So you can set everything. You can opt yeah. out. Label, as a label, C, is, so. label permission control is one of those, like, oops, we created a giant rat's nest of stupidity. And we yes. did it to ourselves and it works, but it only barely works. That is another, that's a great example of like, like 
there are a bunch of people that would probably jump for joy if they could figure out how to separate out labels safely. And the nice thing about labels is while you can't get access to view labels efficiently in Cube, you could absolutely control who could set and view them. And we've already started doing that on nodes. We do that on um, namespaces. We do that uh, with the stuff that people add for like annotations. So there's definitely, a, there's a rich vein to mine there, but we don't have to vein it. Or we don't have to mine it today. Yeah, I think the, uh, the other interesting thing you mentioned was that it could open up hierarchical things. We would only use it in terms of like the the KCP dash prefix or whatever. No, no, no. I was. I would think each KCP would have their own prefix. Like that's what. Oh sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, but like, but then like you could say like, well, if you can do that, then um, is there another subdivision? Like at some point you run out of name length. So like, there's the that's the part I think about hierarchy that we have to mm -hmm. stay. But yeah. The K factor is how many K's can you stick in a namespace name? But we'll just we'll just do the K8S trick, right? We'll just like limit all the in, we'll just remove all the internal letters and replace them with numbers, and that'll work. Fortunately, fortunately, computer scientists love coming up with ways of efficiently compressing prefix trees. So this is not a this is not an unfamiliar problem to the uh, to the industry. Yeah. So. Uh, that is the more medium slash long-term proposal we want to try to push upstream or, or prototype in KCP and then push upstream. But in the meantime, we can unblock ourselves just by doing this namespace uh, administration outside of the cluster and never have such a powerful permission exist on the physical cluster, uh, which will be... Uh, yeah, it, it, there are a lot of secondary reasons for that, which is things like cluster resource quota, you could absolutely leverage with that very cleanly uh sorry cluster resource quota you could link you could leverage very cleanly with namespace prefixes just by controlling which labels get set on those and if you're the one setting up the namespace there's a bunch of stuff there that like it's it's kcp adjacent um, but it starts getting into like what is the policy for how much physical capacity this logical tenant gets which is almost but not exactly an orthogonal subsystem to syncing workloads because if you know that's a you can set if you can break the problems in half and then you can still have a different you know backplane controlling that that's still really well aligned with the control plane mindset um, so that's something um we should talk about with like josh and the um the open cluster management side because that's like a really concrete place where you're like that controller that integration um is a little bit of the back plane for workload. And it's not a front plane problem. It's not the end user's problem. It's the person who made that capacity available. What other constraints do they want to place on the chunks of stuff showing up? So is that, for example, is that saying, uh, is that going to enable us to say this, uh, KCP should never, KCP as a whole should never take up more than this resource, more than this chunk of resources inside my physical cluster and no single namespace synced by KCP should take up more than this slice of that chunk inside of there. Those are both things we could express if resource quotas were prefix capable. Or even without refix, I mean, like you can, that's hierarchical namespace controller effectively generates this stuff in the most, not most inefficient way possible, but it is already doing something like this. And so, you know, it is it is materializing. Most people materialize some form of resource quota and resource quota itself kind of sucks a little bit, but like, you know, these kinds of controls, you could imagine a system which says, if I define this chunk of capacity I wanna to offer to the workload scheduler, and then I, uh, by doing that on that cluster, I have to make that that prepped. I'm then gonna have a set of policies which are my defensiveness against that that between others so there might be competing workloads on there that having a decent system for like expressing that which is like well i'm offering this much capacity i probably want some hard limits in there mm -hmm. when i offer that how would the failure modes translate back up well they're going to impact workloads that's something that the sinker in theory is trying to tackle head on and be like oh no like that what's what is being out of resources mean? What is being blocked mean? Well, we're just going to generically solve that and do our best. Well, what does our best look like? Well, recognizing certain failure conditions, surfacing messages effectively is like suddenly that interplay uh, starts working. And then again, because that interplay is going back up to the to the workload control side, 
the workload controllers can also do things like, oh, you know, I'm getting an unusual amount of errors here for whatever reason. We talked about this in previous meetings. Like that's when you start thinking about rebalancing or uh, summarizing or alerting. Like, hey, somebody made a mistake. It surfaces really fast because there's a nice propagation to workload impact, which today everybody creating their own crap, like my GitOps thing over here, my tool over here, my controller over here, each of those fails in magical and unique and special snowflake ways. The more workloads you can concentrate under the, you know, relatively agnostic layer, those controllers don't even necessarily have to worry about as many of those problems because they're just depending on a separate subsystem being like, yeah, yeah, yeah like this cluster seems flaky all of a sudden. Yeah, uh, Stefan, you had a, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, so the link I pasted there, the second last comment, maybe we can go through that quickly. I just want to make people aware because everything that Clayton just um, sketched uh, might fit there. Like some somebody could start modeling those things just to get a more concrete idea. Which uh, so, which link? The external yeah, CPM? So, um, yes, that one. More like in the second half, I think. Or just search for external sync. Basically, David and I tried to rethink what we have in the KCP prototype at the moment in a world where we have API imports, exports, so aligning with the ideas you made there. And if you scroll down a bit, then you see all the types. So this just models this problem. Um, and it leads to API exports at the end. So basically, external sync um, is what an administrator defines to connect certain resources to physical clusters for workspaces which import the resulting API. So it has a list of resources. It has a list of locations, maybe referencing cluster objects or something like that. Um, and there's a status for all, for each of them, how far the syncing is, whether it's pause, so failure conditions, how to present them. And um, we also had the idea of a template, like uh, typical OpenShift workload types could be a template and we could just mm -hmm. reference that with, uh, instead of listing all 17 types, which makes sense to sync. If you go up a bit yeah. from the external sync, um, there is a negotiation happening and the negotiation depends on external sync resource location. So there's one object for each or the product out of location and resource. And this basically is a placeholder for the discovery data, which we get from the physical cluster for this resource. And this external sync resource location is then merged via some strategy like LCD or GCD, depending on what you set in the in the external sync, mm -hmm. um, into the negoti negotiated schema inside of this uh, object, which is in the middle now, it's external sync resource or negotiated resource. So this is a schema which is actually used by the workspaces which um, subscribe to this API. And subscribing happens that this one is, um, it's turned into an API export, the same idea we had with Third Manager as a controller, which offers APIs. There's an API export with this schema or the negotiated schema, and then workspaces can import them. And probably all workspaces will import certain types, at least those workspaces which want compute. Uh, Andy, yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Just a quick question. Is this meant to um, interact with or be used by the cluster controller today that's doing the API syncing? Yes, the, the synca, so the basic idea behind that is that, I mean, it's in the context of virtual workspaces. There will be a virtual workspace, which is the, the, basically the, the data source for the synca. The synca will get a URL where it sees all the tenants of those API imports, basically all workspaces which want to compute. And it will see all deployments, for example, in this virtual workspace. In That's the status one. of the external main external sync, don't you have something like a URL that provides the, uh, yes. Yes, the virtual yeah, workspace yeah. that would expose all the APIs, but with the real, you know, 
or the discovery that corresponds to the negotiated schemas of all the uh, objects, the sinker, this sink, the sinker of this external sink set uh, would want to sink. So if the sinker, typically, if the sinker would point to this URL, it would get the exactly the discovery uh, and uh, the objects that it needs to watch. Am I right? Yes. It will do a consistent list watch over that and get all the objects of all mm -hmm. workspaces and sync them. And of course, we can use controller sharding to make that uh, more scalable yeah. with many sinkers. Yeah, and, and like the scale, the core scale dimension of these types is with number of physical cluster locations, which is probably like nodes in cube, a small subset of the overall workload. So it's dominated by other terms. Um, so that's good. Uh, so Stefan, to go back a little bit, like one thing that, and, and maybe like I'm, there's, we, we probably need to get terminology in place, but I think there's two strategies, two types of strategy at play. And like GCD and LCD is like the one type when we're talking about like how you want to approach the type and how it's reconciliation. We may want to come up with a separate name for that uh, or name it in terms of the context that it's being used. The other type of strategy, and I was briefly alluding to this on the Slack thread, and it's been a while since Jason and I have talked about it, I know, um, which is like, in the big picture, we want, we'll probably have hard coded handling behavior in the sinker for specific types, right? Like, uh, whether that's called a strategy or like the sync strategy or transformation strategy, like whatever, that might actually be the long run, uh, the sinker as a controller framework, unlike the cubelet should not be this like totally closed system, because I think we can imagine many different types of sinkers. And we can imagine many different types. So there is a design constraint on the sinker in the long run, I think, which would be the idea of transforming the type as it comes out or one type splitting the multiple. We might want to spend more time on that as a construct within the sinker than like other types of controllers would, right? Endpoints controller is just endpoints controller. But the sinker might have some of that, like we need to come up with a word that defines the act of transformation. So this is like a good terminology opportunity to like split the concept of how the the object is transformed or the how the object is unified. Strategy is a good word for it. When, you, when, when you talk about transformation, give an example. So what, I'd say a concrete example would be you have an ingress object in a logical cluster. That ingress object is transformed into a gateway API object as part of a strategy for saying, hey, on this cluster, the mechanism whereby ingress is delivered to this cluster is actually not based on routes or ingress or a, an HA proxy ingress or a Nginx ingress, but it's instead using the gate, the bog standard gateway API. That strategy effectively looks at an ingress, maps it to a gateway object, creates the gateway object. The status, the summarization of it back to the ingress might include no. So there's a part of that strategy for that that says, I'm converting the gateway API object status to nothing, or I transform it to that annotation in the metadata of the ingress object that a higher level controller looks at. There is so a it, in, in my words, um, you would have basically resources which are not using the identity for transformation, but they have special logic. The Some other uh, config maps, for example, there will be identity, right? They will be just synced over. That's simple. And, so, and uh, RBAC might have like a partial identity strategy where like, or a filtering strategy where like some RBAC rules are dropped when copied down or some role bindings are, uh, rollbacks have a, uh, a drop strategy. The name for what the strategy is, it might be code. I think in the very early days of the project, when we were kind of spitballing, I was anticipating that on order, I would probably expect us to have maybe 20 or 30 type specific transformations, some of which might get very complex and involve other objects and might themselves be complex. And then there might be a large class of like identity, like standard transformations, identity, um, CEL, like you could imagine someone being able to define and say like, oh, here's my new CRD. Here's the strategy for it. Here's a cell, a cell transform. Do these two things. 
And each of those strategies could either be contributed in code. Eventually, we might have APIs for them. In the short run, it's all code written in the sinker, hard coded and deployed. But one of the advantages of code is someone could audit that, review it, and say, oh, um, I'm working in a high trust environment, and I'm actually going to make additional rules, and I'm going to take the existing sinker and say, hey, you know that deployment strategy that's somewhat deployment aware? I'm going to do things like, oh, this has a pod template. I will forcibly strip all of these fields out, and it is not a one-to-one -one transformation. And I can review that and put it into a high sec environment and say, I'm confident that the only objects that show up on the other side have these characteristics or something. So that's a there's a there's a bunch of depth under it. That is probably similar to external sync, but it kind of starts getting into this like the configuration of the sinker. I just wanted to like strategy is a word that we have used for that, but we haven't actually formally come up with like a clarifying word for it, like transformation strategy or a sync strategy um, or resource sync strategy, and then put a definition in place. And it's, it's probably time for us to start doing that, maybe in the transparent multi-cluster design or uh, in a separate new design, which sits alongside transparent multi-cluster and this, that's the intersection of those two. Yeah. How does it relate to, how does it relate to uh, the two steps syncing that I had showed uh, I mean, the prototype I had showed some time ago. Um, of course, there were a number of things to, you know, clean up or, or rethink. But th the main idea was to let um, the syncing be done in two steps, uh, which both were, you know, controller based. That means that. Um, yeah, I, I'll say I like the prototype and the ideas explored. David, I think we need to actually have a design that we're all going to review because it's going to be fundamental to the project. And it might be that some of the trade-offs there that the two-step one have would be not acceptable because of amplification, yeah, sure. or that those are just two parts that should be in the same controller, or that those actually, we, we want to conceptually think about it as two steps, but it might actually just be treated as one step from the perspective of code organization. All of those are valid points. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, my, my my question was also, um, do we expect this to be, uh, I mean, finally easily pluggable from outside? I mean, or or then you or you have to inject code like, you know, really in your KCP with admission controls or with well, so the sinker, or, or by replacing the whole sinker. I think the sinker eventually should look a little bit more like Kubelet than like a controller, but it shouldn't look all the way like Kubelet because even Kubelet shouldn't look like Kubelet. Kubelet should look more like a controller. And Kubelet eventually may look more like a KCP instance. Mm. So like thinking about like the spectrum of choices we have, the sinker, I think, if done right, could be a very important component, but we still need to keep prototyping down the path we're on to get closer to you know, maybe it's not as important that people be able to fork it, or maybe it doesn't need that much flexibility. Our first use cases are going to be entirely hard coded. So it's mostly mm -hmm. a theoretical okay. exercise yeah. to frame a little bit of what uh, room that we'll leave for ourselves in the API or being able to say, oh, we're not going to do any of this, but we've described what we're not doing so that we know later not to do the things that we said we weren't yeah. doing accidentally, but instead deliberately. And CL yeah, right. could do lots of that, right? Piping out fields pretty easy. I, exactly. I do want to be careful to, like Clayton said, start with, you know, a handful of hard coded things, get too many hard coded things, and then abstract to something pluggable. I don't yeah, want to it, jump straight to pluggable because we're going to get it wrong. Yeah, it should have good code organization based on what we the problem we have now, and then we will refactor the code organization, and then we will yeah. look at the path between, the, unlike webhooks, which, like there are webhooks was like one particular point on a design spectrum where we knew going in, it would be the worst of all possible trade-offs. It would be the best of the worst options. And what we are saying, I think with a sinker is what we're working from like the do it all in code, it's a monolith. Then we will look at flexibility, code organization and structure once we have enough examples. And then we will take use cases for things like, mm -hmm. hey, I want to be able to add a new CRD to the high level control plane that exists on one of these clusters or doesn't exist on one of these clusters, but will transform into an object that neither Sinker nor KCP knew about ahead of time. And we will take design requirements for what does that look like once we understand what that problem is, as Jason is saying. 
Yeah, I want to take a second to surface some questions in the comments. Paul said, is versioning applicable on these strategies based on what is consuming the transformed object? I think versioning is not something we've thought about so far, but definitely we need to have a versioning strategy involved somewhere or else upgrading KCP and upgrading the synchro on the cluster is going to potentially have a, a different implementation of what the transformation logic is, either either when it's hard-coded upgrading the sinker or when it's pluggable, changing the pluggable, you know, changing the cell uh, uh, script or whatever. We'll need to be careful about that upgrade strategy. And and the, the mental model, Paul, that's very useful is clusters are going to have a small number of types. Physical clusters should have 20 CRDs. 20 custom types and is 50 of the same types over and over and over again. The design point we are optimizing for is a small number of APIs on physical clusters that are used generically by a broad ecosystem of novel and exciting APIs that might want to translate down to those boring old standard cube APIs with maybe some standards. So like we don't want to support a thousand different uh, gateway ingress APIs on physical clusters. We want people to end up with the same physical clusters in lots of places because that benefits everybody because the end goal of this is that workloads move across clusters and every API that's different on a physical cluster is a failure or an, a shard that's going to happen. It will be important, but it won't be as critical as uh, the other side of the equation there. Right. We will, we will schedule around compatible uh, physical clusters with compatible APIs, but we want that to be uniform so that we have as much flexibility as Incompati possible. Incompatible APIs is a bug that KCP will route around. Perfect. Uh, uh, Igor also asked, <laughs> what granularity do we expect on Synchro implementations? Um, uh, can you elaborate on that question or does, um, does somebody else have an answer? Hi, yeah. Yeah, I can. Uh, so, um, do we look for implementations on one-to-one -one deployments, pods, and and whatever, or we look into collection of resources as well? Because I do see these as an opportunity to have, for example, a Helm sinker, where the input would be a Helm package and the output would be like uh, resources on KCP that gets uh, deployed everywhere. So, so I would say, Igor, that is an example of something that would be a control plane. Like that would be a controller on the control plane and it would translate Helm charts into resources in the KCP instance. It is not, I would probably say that think of the pipe between like the use case is transparent multi-cluster. Transparent means you're either at the control plane translating big APIs into cube-like APIs and then sinker is the pipe or rarely you have a complex type in the control plane that the sinker pipe does some expansion into. I would say that's rare or more rare, but it could be that we come back to it and like imagine a Helm object. I don't really think we want to have lots of different types of sinkers. I don't think that's the design principles and use case principles we're organized around because if the sinker is pretty predictable, then what actually is where most people do work their work is they take their control plane objects and they explode it. Like there's nothing, like a Helm chart is something that as a real example would be, that's an explosion on the control plane side because the point of KCP is to make basic cube primitives useful in a multi-cluster context by placing them without users having to really worry about it. So if Helm was exploding, you would lose all of that status. It's not, it's not impossible. Like I would say these are, it is a valid point on the design spectrum. Sinker is kind of towards the more physical, same set of objects all the time. That is more of a control plane API that's just like you know any expansion. Um, it's totally reasonable to do that, the control plane, and to summarize it. Okay, so if I understood correctly, then this is, would be like a replacement for federation or some form of federation with uh, synchronizing uh, resources acro across dif uh, different physical clusters. Right. So, so basically, the end goal is to KCP always receive the resources that we are going to produce somehow, and the, the KCP is going to distribute those uh, resources across available physical clusters. The sinker component is intended to transform mostly objects from similar forms to similar forms, for the express purpose of of keeping the 
an intention of an API the same when you're in multi-cluster contexts. So it's a little bit like Federation and Federation V2, but they strayed from some of these paths and there's similarities to other things. It is a useful first order approximation to say that. I think that there's a ton of nuance that we don't know yet where we may find the example we are we this example of the most dramatic transformation right now is like ingress to gateway API and back or um, a high level PVC to a underlying representation that actually doesn't look anything like a PVC does today. Those are um, transforming the high level intent to achieve an outcome of if you were on a cluster, creating a PVC means something. We're kind of trying to take the idealized version of what creating a PVC means and let it work in a multi-cluster context. It does not mean though that we might not have a sinker. Like we, I would love for there to be projects like forking sinkers where people are like, oh no, no, it's actually super useful to have a, a simplified resource up top that is exploded into a whole bunch of complex objects. We just haven't really, we think that if you do that, you're gonna lose some of the other benefits of like scheduling and placement. So it's kind of the, KCP as a problem is excluding a certain class of, you know, types of controllers that start at the control plane and and act individually on physical clusters, but we don't exclude those um, OCM and um, like uh, a lot of the high level control planes like hub clusters patterns people have, uh, you know, GitOps. A lot of those are high level control planes reifying onto controllers clusters we should enable those but maybe sinker and the transparent multi-cluster is not specifically geared towards that awesome thank you um yeah i, I also want to um make it clear that when we're not just talking about the transformation one way from the high level thing to the low level thing it's also aggregating you know you gave me an ingress and i splatted 30 objects out here to make it work i also need to be able to unsplat those 30 objects back into an ingress status to to sync it back up to KCP in a way that it understands, um, which I think it's easy to imagine how splitting works in CEL. It's a bit harder to imagine how s splitting and aggregating work in CEL. I mean, it, it's not impossible either, but like you have to write two things now and test them and make sure that they work together. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Stefan, I want to make sure that we did. Was there anything else you wanted to talk about on the external sync uh, API doc? No, it's just to make everybody aware. There's this work. We are working in the set in the context of virtual workspaces. Have that in the back of the head. Yeah. Um, that will be a next use case to implement, to prototype that. Yeah. And this will be so the, the namespace scheduler currently does uh discovery and watching of resources on a workspace. And instead of it just says give me all your types and let me know when any of those things change, it should instead only uh well. It will look at everything, label things. The sinker will only look for certain things and pull them. Uh, it the, will just, it will only see those things it should see. That's a better wording. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, and the, the virtual workspace space, makes this real. Yeah. yeah, the namespace scheduler should only look for things that the sinker will care about and shouldn't bother uh, updating all kinds of other things. Steve had a question. Don't you do discovery in logical clusters? Yes, we are doing discovery against the logical cluster. Uh, but, but, but we it, should only look for resources of types we know the sinker will care about. Yeah. Yeah, and and if I understand correctly, the Sorry. virtual workspace uh, in in this regard uh, for syncing is mainly uh, about reconciliation of the um, uh, models that are published by each logical cluster, because then when you want to watch consistently do a consistent list watch across a number of uh, logical cluster whose APIs are individually a bit different. Then we have to, you have to use the published uh, model that is the reconciliation of, of the schemas in all these logical clusters, which is the uh, goal of the API export that would be made available through a virtual workspace. I do want to note, um, and so maybe this is like something I forgot to bring up when we were talking about it, which was um, one of the things that a sinker like a kubelet uh, is doing is just holding a bunch of types in memory from the source model, the upstream, the, the, the logical cluster model of like, here's what should be here. 
And it is also doing the minimum it can to efficiently like apply and keep those things in sync on the cluster, which probably means holding them in memory. Like we're not really good. Like there's a, we, we basically do a bunch of rough art. At least algorithmically, we know that that's probably manageable even today because the things and the things we create are roughly one-to-one -one on average. And it's a subset of the total control plane workload on that cluster because we're not creating more things on a cluster than the control plane can already handle. So, you know, think about this as you have a physical cluster, you divide it into four locations and there's four different sinkers. Each of those four is probably one fourth the total resource load. And we're not putting more things onto that physical cluster than the physical cluster would normally do. Maybe like 50% more because it's efficient, but not an order of magnitude more. So in theory, one of the advantages of a sinker is it is a kind of modeling a type of controller which brings everything into memory. And the moment you have everything in memory to solve a problem, you open up some doors of, oh, there's types of problems that are very efficient to go solve like this. Like I've got a bunch of policy objects and I've got a bunch of desired state objects. Um, when it's all in memory and at the scale of it is, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of objects at most that already kind of have to be reasonably efficient. You really open up some opportunities for there's a lot of transformations that you can do that become super cheap. We need to be open to exploring those as they come up. We're not doing it right now, but it's like the stuff like, um, oh, you can you can actually reason about and do things with those objects because you have a view of everything here that's going down to here. Uh, it's a little bit like the scheduler in cube we were able to you know the scheduler in cube is a pretty rich modeling system of the system you can make a lot of important things you can determine a lot of things that the scheduler is doing and visualize that to the people using it that is very valuable that we leverage only one percent of right like you know the scheduler is making decisions but the whole thing about like you know descheduler and being like oh the decisions were good a week ago they're not good now the schedule already has all that info in memory we just don't leverage it efficiently in all cases that kind of synergy is really important for sinker and probably new types of controller patterns in the future where you have a control plane and a shard and you're bringing all this in memory and making some efficient stuff that pattern will be generally useful there's a lot of places where you can be like oh this could be very, very useful for how someone understands what workloads are showing up on a cluster from a security perspective or a relationship perspective. And we don't have to do anything about it right now, but it is useful to think about. We are opening the door in the ecosystem for things that benefit from that kind of bird's eye view of like, here's everything that's going on this cluster. Oh, we can draw the relationships, report security, add transformations, um, like even some of the strategy stuff we're talking about. Uh, doing OPA at that level, you know, systems that call out to other systems to say like, oh, I want to treat these as an atomic unit and then accept or reject them altogether. There might be security policies, uh, scanning techniques, uh, transformations across types like, hey, if you get this kind of docker.io slash library slash PostgreSQL colon latest, instead of just naively sticking that in there may be more advanced policy things that you could do which is like oh transform that to a url that talks to a global distributed registry that has a local on cluster cache that offers you know 75 percent better end latency for start and also takes security considerations out of the picture because there'll be a separate chain for authorizing that so some of those transformations will be very powerful i think that's another thing that we don't have to solve right now but it's like uh there's a we're, we're setting up a goose that might have golden eggs um we need to be like kind of like oh there's some gold peeking out from underneath that nest um as we're going so that's another reason why some of this stuff is really important to frame even even now and i if I may uh, ask, uh, did you did you guys outline uh, the capabilities that this system might have with uh, disaster recovery uh, workloads, uh, moving workloads between clusters and stuff like that? Yeah, that's because it's, yeah, because that's covered in the transparent mode. Natural. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I, this Jason, I think, is a. Uh, the transparent multi-cluster design, we need to get to the next stage of it where we get some of this stuff down. So after we get through prototype two, like, um, you know, the Igor, that's one doc that's shared, but like there should be a couple of other docs that sketch out some of these paths. Um, and we should probably make sure we're divvying up and, and getting that down. Yeah, let me share that doc uh, here just to make sure 
uh, we have it shared with the KCP uh, list. But yeah, the uh, one of the first things we ever wanted, in fact, the first ever prototype was giving KCP a deployment and having deployments scheduled on two clusters so that, I mean, the networking wasn't set up and everything, but at least you could see like, I asked for 15 replicas and seven are here and nine are here or whatever. So um, yeah, and that's a zero downtime disaster recovery scenario because there's replicas both places. But in the meantime, we're sort of working on generalizing how to do that with anything and how to do that just moving stuff instead of having two, two copies uh, moving things when a cluster goes down. That's that's prototype two. So, and then layering on top of it, networking and layering underneath it, volumes and all of that fun stuff. Um, great. Uh, I, yeah, any any more topics on transformation and syncing and any uh, any ideas about policy that have come out of this? I think it's all very exciting. We should we should give a KubeCon talk about this stuff. That's what they call a callback. All right, uh, unless there's anything else to discuss, I'm more than happy to give everybody 12 minutes back. Uh, all right, times 12 people. That's like that's like 144 minutes. It's a lot of money. That's right. That's right. Shareholder value, everyone. All right. Uh, take care. Have a lovely uh, day, week. See you around on the internet. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you. Forgot to stop the recording.